And according to the author, no intelligent woman hmm, should think of making a man who, in her estimation, is not worthy to take that position. So if you think a man is not worthy to be leading you, not worthy to be your head, then you shouldn't even decide in the first place to, to, to get into that relationship. That's what it means. Because... <laughs> everyone welcome to my youtube channel so today i'm going to be doing a book review titled the women questions okay authored by kenneth higgins um this book is um comprising or centered around controversial women topics conversations that women have been meaning to have for the longest time we've heard a lot about these issues and topics and some people are really wanting to they are eager to know what exactly is the truth about this topic so we are reviewing them from a biblical view a biblical point of view okay but a quick disclaimer this book is not authored by me okay i'm just doing a book review but i'm as well trusting the holy spirit to help me you know share some of the things he laid on my heart while i was reviewing this book okay so sit back and sit tight because trust me you're going to enjoy this particular one it's very very interesting topics okay so don't go away <music> book has seven chapters and introduction the first question is um is the man the head of the woman Two, must wives obey their husbands in everything most women keep silence in the churches most women always cover their heads in the churches and then proper adornment and um dress yeah proper adornment and dress for christian women and a conclusion okay let me start off by saying that um, if we want to be spiritually correct, there is only one way, and that's the Holy Spirit, okay? I am an ardent uh, Bible scholar, okay? I believe so much in um, the scriptures, and I believe everything, like, I believe everything the scripture has said, everything. And I think it should be the same for anyone who is a believer, okay? Because the Bible made us realize in 2 Timothy, it said that all scriptures, all scriptures is given by the inspiration of God, and that it is profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for correction, and instructions in righteousness. So this book is made for us. And if we must know the real meaning, like, true meanings of this book then we must believe the on the one who has inspired the writing of the book i think that's the ultimate way so don't just take my word for it you can go back to your bible then ask that the holy spirit speak to you as well so that you can be sure like because the bible says that we have a witness and i know that the holy spirit is a teacher okay the holy spirit will teach us he said he will show us things that we don't even know he will show it to us all right, so he knows the mind of God and what God was trying to say or what God is trying to say. So he will take it, he will take that scripture and he will reveal it to you and you will know it. Because it is easy for anyone to believe anything. Okay, anyone can, uh, anyone can easily want to say anything, find scriptures that they think they want in the scripture, misinterpret them and make them mean whatever they want for it to mean that's what i'm saying <laughs> okay like for instance an auntie of mine that i once live with when she wants to deceive me sometimes she will tell me uh, that the bible says you should suffer not a witch to live then she will beat me flog me you know is, is that is that correct is that what the bible was saying am i a witch then she will call me a witch and beat me up okay so anyone can take i'm just saying that by the way anyone can take any scriptures make them mean whatever they want it to mean, or, mean, or suppose them to mean whatever they want for it to mean, and that is not what it means ultimately, okay? So before you come for me, eh, try and follow me closely and watch this video till the end. Most importantly, let the Holy Spirit speak to you, okay? Actually, there's an acknowledgement that is written by A.C. Nelson, who is an expert in Greek and Hebrew language. So a lot of research has been put into this book, okay? Um, both historical, theological, spiritual research. So you can be rest assured. I'm starting off with reading this background scriptures, two background scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 to 36. It says, let your women keep silence in the churches. Listen closely. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but as they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, he said, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. He said, what? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? That is 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34 to 36. 
Now, First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12 says, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. He said, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, this was from um, the epistles of Paul. Um, has created a lot of perplexities in the heart of women, especially, okay? Especially women who feel like they have a special call of God on their life and who feel like there is a burning desire to be more for God, okay? And they think that that cannot be smothered out. So this has been a source of perplexity and people keep wondering, are they, are they supposed to just keep silence? Just like I've read from, established from these two scriptures because that's what those scriptures say okay in some christian settings or in certain christian settings women have been forbidden to teach to preach okay to even um conduct or be in positions of just little okay just little programs handle little programs in the churches and in some more conservative um this thing they have loosened up a bit to a level that okay Women should not teach and preach, but they can do other things like they can learn um, some lessons for missionaries. They can teach the children in the children's church. They can, you know, do lesser, um, lesser, non significant positions. Okay, that is it for more conservative area. In certain places, some women are not even allowed to even say anything. So people believe that women are not even allowed to ask questions okay you can't ask you can't question anything that is being said just do as you are told okay um some people will merely want to brush aside what bro paul says saying that he's a woman hater okay and they established or they try to propose some of these theories based on the fact that paul was never married and that most of the epistles he wrote was against women in fact you know um that he wrote that some women some people should not get married that it's better for you not to be uh, married and for you to be married, you know, and based on some of these things and so, so many other letters that he wrote. If you if you if you read the book of Romans, the book of Timothy, the book of Peter, there's so many things that Paul said directly and indirectly that looked like or that made it seem like, and that has made some people, certain set of people, make propositions and theories to conclude that Paul was a woman hater. But no, Paul wasn't a human hater. We're going to establish that from the scriptures okay and a lot of propositions have come from that message that paul wanted to put women down wanted women to be subordinated in all the means and all of that but these things are actually take, being taken out of context that is not the real thing that paul was trying to imply okay and we're going to establish that from the scriptures if you read the book of hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 he says that marriage is honorable in all so paul wasn't a woman either because the Bible clearly says that marriage is honorable. So, and then if uh, Bro Paul didn't want uh, women to be involved in decisions at all, he wouldn't say, you know, when he was talking about um, the characteristics that are expected of someone who is a deacon, someone who is an elder, he said, let the man be someone who is of one wife. Okay, why did it matter to Bro Paul that you have one wife? If he didn't want, or if he thought that women were not relevant, he could simply have told Timothy and Titus that, okay, this position, this very important position should only be occupied by, okay, unmarried men. So that would have made it more, I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying, that would have made it more direct. Okay, Paul didn't want women to participate in anything. But it was clear, he said, um, men who are going to be bishops, who are going to be deacons and elders, they should be men who are men of one wife who are not busy bodies who have raised godly children who are, who are able to have rule over their homes you know so that um kind of cemented the fact that paul was not a woman hater rather Paul spoke in terms which signified his standards for womanhood and for his respect for women okay let me show you from the scripture the book of romans Romans chapter 16 and verse 1 and 2. He said, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, which is the servant of the church, which is a centurion. He said, verse 2, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saint, that you are sister in whatsoever business she had need of you. For she had been a succorer of many and of myself also. So she was trying to say that they should help Phoebe, that she's a succorer of Paul's ministry. Okay, she said she has assisted me that the church should render help unto her in all the capacities that she needs it. So if Paul didn't like women, he won't say that. Now, there were so many letters that Paul wrote in the book of Romans. You remember when he, tried, he talked about 
Trifena and Trifosa and then Persis, they were all women. And you remember he kept on, you know, encouraging, he wrote a lot of letters that they should greet this person, greet this person, appreciate this person. These were women who were relevant in the ministry, who were supporting the ministry of Bob Paul then. Not just the ministry of Bob Paul, even the church ministry. And he was bearing witness that these women have done well. We should encourage them, the church should support them. So if Bro Paul didn't want women to be relevant, like people concluded the way that they have denied a lot of women. Okay, so, so many non-conservative churches don't allow women to do anything. Like you just come, you stay in church, you go back home. Anything your husband says is what you follow and all of that. That's why we are trying to establish this point, okay? To tell you that Paul was not a woman hater, okay? Now, there was... Um, the book of Romans chapter 16 and verse 12, okay, if you read Romans 16 verse 3 and 4, he said, Greet Priscilla, greet Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. So he was saying, these women have given all they can, they've given almost their life just for, for the sake of the ministry. All the churches are thanking them, we are appreciative of them. So if these women were not relevant, doing anything in the church, do you think all this appreciation will be flowing out? No way. So these are just to establish that Paul wasn't a woman hater. Okay. In verse, let me conclude it by saying that in verse 13 of that same book of Romans, chapter 16, it was saying, greet Rufus, greet the mother of Rufus, greet my own mother as well, you know. All these were just accolades that were going out for women. So if Paul didn't want or didn't mean for women to be relevant or significant, or that they didn't, weren't even doing, if they weren't doing anything in the church or in the body of Christ, then all this will not be happening, okay? So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 23 says that, Husbands, he said, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. See the way he said it. Men should love their wife, even the same way that they love themselves. So on the contrary, all this show that this great apostle, though he, he denied himself the sweet refining purpose of marriage, okay, he wasn't married. You know, he didn't tell us for whatever reason, but you can actually tell from many of the letters that he wrote because he just wanted to give himself wholly, he wanted to give himself wholeheartedly to the things of God. That was probably why he didn't get to marry. But the reasons he was writing all these letters or that he gave all these admonitions that a lot of people have now generalized to mean so many things today was for clarification and edification and admonition proper um, so that people, the church can keep working in uprightness. Okay, of the church. So this is just a background introduction. Okay, because everything we are talking about today is about women. Now, chapter two is the man, the head of the woman. Okay. Now let's see the scripture. First Corinthians chapter eleven and verse um, three. First Corinthians eleven verse three. He says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, so if you look at this scripture, the surface plain meaning appears to be that the man is the head of the woman. Okay, but if you read other translations, you will see it will help you to understand this scripture better because it is totally in agreement with what the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 says. Okay, totally in agreement with Ephesians 5 23. That is if you read it from other translations. Let me show you. Um, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, same thing. He says... But I wish you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the wife, the head of the wife is the husband, and the head of Christ is God. Unlike what King James Version says, you need to also understand that scriptures, this scripture was initially written in their purest forms, that's in Greek and in Hebrew language, but while they were being translated, some of the meaning, the true meaning were lost, okay, because of context, settings, and various English and all of that, okay, so now, if you read it, the book of Ephesians chapter 5 already says that the husband is the head of the wife. So that is totally in agreement with that same 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 that says that the head of, I would have you know, I wish you to know that the head of every man, the head of every man is Christ. Okay. And the head of the wife, the head of the wife is the husband and the head of Christ is God. Now, um, is every man the head of every woman? Assuredly, no. Okay. 
every man is the head of one woman and that is his wife i don't know if you are getting the head of every man the head of every man hmm, is god but the man is the head of just a woman is not the head of every woman just like um grace's husband cannot be my head okay it's the same thing by saying the only person who is permitted to be my head is my husband that's what the that scripture is saying the head of every wife is the husband note that the head of every woman is a man you cannot be the head you cannot be a man and be the head of every woman it's not policy you don't have any business being the head of another person's woman you are only permitted to be the head of one woman and that woman is your wife i don't know if it makes sense now so many religious teachers have come out to say that um, the man is the head of the woman okay they just tell you that anything the man says the woman is supposed to obey it doesn't matter that even if a man says you should sleep with another if a man says you should sleep with another man uh tells a woman to sleep with another man she should be willing to do it okay that if a, a man tells a woman to kill herself or do something terrible she should do it because that's what the bible says no that is clearly not what the bible says the head of every wife is the husband okay that is only applying to that was written to apply for domestic it was written from a domestic standpoint spiritual standpoint from a spiritual standpoint of view the head of the woman is not the man the head of the woman is Christ. Most of them, because the Bible says, just as Christ is the head of the church. So the wife is in the church, the husband is in the church. So the head of the church is Christ. So it means that from a spiritual view, the husband is not the Lord of the wife's conscience. Your husband does not have the right to judge your conscience, which is your spirit. Both of you are tenable to a leader to a Lord, to a head. And that headship is Christ. So this particular instruction was written in the settings and the in the context of husband and wife standpoints okay you, you you can't see you don't have as a man you don't have any business meddling with another wife's or another woman's dressing that's not your business okay as a man you don't have any business meddling with another woman's outlook the way she puts her hair, the way she walks, the way she dresses, that's not your bloody business. According to the scriptures, so long as the Bible is concerned, you should only be concerned. Your business should be your home. Your home is your wife, your children. You should be able to put a rule over your house. Okay? So if you succeed in, okay, putting all of those idiosyncrasies in your wife, that's a problem. Okay? That is her business it is nobody's business nobody can come and tell your wife or should be telling another man's wife how to dress how to appear how to keep her hair how to work how to be comported you know and etc that is not allowed by Blakely. okay you should rule your home your home so if your husband does not have a problem with it then it is nobody's business now let me establish a fact from the scriptures okay in the new testament okay the greek word for husband and man wasn't differentiated from the greek word it means the same thing and that is anna a-n-e-r okay the greek word for a woman and wife was it wasn't also separated in greek is the same thing and that is gyne g-y-n-e okay so it is now left for you to know the settings in which and who bro paul is speaking to so sometimes Paul might be speaking in the context of Anna and I'm still be, be referring to husbands. He might also be speaking to men in another context and still be I'm be talking about husbands and he will still use Anna. Okay, you see, because there is no separate word for husband and man. It's the same thing in Greek, A-N-E-R. And for women, it's the same thing. So it is now you who understands in the setting and the context in which it is used. It's not possible that Paul was talking to all men and answered that the head of every every woman is the man. A man cannot be the head of every woman. Just like, you know, because men and women, okay, men and women have just one head in the Lord. A man is subordinate or subject to the Lord, same way that a woman is subject to the Lord. As long as the Lord is concerned, he said there is no male and female. According to the scripture, say there is no male and female. So God sees us the same thing. A man is no more superior to a woman before God, just like a woman is no more superior to a man 
before God. God sees them the same thing because the Bible says that God is the head of the church. Okay, and if both of them are in the church, is the woman in the church? Yes, is the man in the church? Yes. So if Christ is the head of the church, that means both of them are submitted, okay, to the leadership or to the headship of Christ. Okay. So this scripture is only talking about domestic standpoint. What does that even supposed to mean? It's just talking about order as far as the family, um, the family arrangement or order is concerned, or the family government is concerned. As far as the family government is concerned, that is what the scripture is addressing, not spiritually. The husband is not the head of his wife spiritually. If if, if it was the head of the wife, that means a wife will have to wait till the husband says he, he, he can come to God before coming to God. And there are so many families where um, the wife is even more closer to God, has even a closer intimate fellowship with God than her husband. Some husbands are not even saved. So it means that for women who are married to unsaved husbands, they will have to keep waiting all their lives till the day their husbands say, oh, now you can come to the knowledge of Christ before they come to Jesus. That's what it means. That, what, that is what it implies. So from the context of the Bible, what Bro Paul was trying to say was that as long as the family order and government is concerned, the head of every wife is a husband. The head of every wife is a husband. So, and that is for order, for orderliness. Okay? You remember when um, the book of Genesis, when after creating man, the Bible said he gave them dominion over all things. He didn't say... Um, and this dominion is only for Adam. This dominion, so for over every other thing, is the same thing, okay? There is no male or female. God made them equally, okay? And when he even brought the woman, when he, he found that, oh, this man has a need, and that was the, that's the reason why a man is leads the house. The woman was made, Abby, the woman was made for the man. Yes, that's what the Bible says. The woman was made for the man, and he made them to be helpmate. They are not supposed to be, master servant kind of relationship even if it is from a domestic point they're only saying that the Bible was or Bob Paul was only trying to admonish in the sense that okay there is order somebody should be leading somebody should be taking more responsibilities the authority is issued to the man and the woman is supporting the woman is assisting and doesn't mean that the woman becomes a slave no it's only saying that the man Wears, okay, is in a position of leadership and assumes more responsibility that the woman should be willing to allow him to step into joyfully. Like she should see him in that position, occupying that position, using that authority joyfully. So if people naturally feel the positions that God has created for them, it will be easy for them to function together without problems. You see, if a, a woman also understands that, oh, this position is for my husband, you won't even try to be usurping authority from him, trying to claim or put him down, trying to make him a laughing stock before the neighbors. No, you will want to support him. You will be happy while he's wearing that shoe of authority. And also he will be happy while you are Wearing your own shoe of authority as well because you're supposed to be a helping mini, like both of you are supposed to be submitting to one another. And what that simply means, by all means, look for a way to look for a way to walk around it that you are more agreeable, that you have less conflict, that you have less problem, that there's less disagreement, that at least to an extent there is unity. The, the, the bond of unity that you people share is strengthened. That's what Bro Paul was trying to say. So it is only from a domestic point because. And according to the author, no intelligent woman hmm, should think of making a man who, in her estimation, is not worthy to take that position. So if you think a man is not worthy to be leading you, not worthy to be your head, then you shouldn't even decide in the first place to, to, to get into that relationship. That's what it means. Because you're going to submit to this man for the rest of your life. So if you think he's not worthy, you estimate him to not be worthy of standing in, in that position, then you should know better not to be in it in the first place. You cannot get married now tomorrow and you say you can't submit to this man who is it to give you instruction. He's the head. So long as the Bible is concerned, that is the position of leadership. He leads that family and you support him, you encourage him, you work together with him. But it doesn't mean that everything he says is yes. It doesn't mean that you can't correct him. It doesn't mean that... Um, ultimately, he has the mantle. Some you see, we, we have good women who help their husband to make better decisions, who even see clearer than what 
their husband would have seen okay but you also need to understand that the fact that Paul said that men should be the head of leadership and don't forget we say this is for domestic from a domestic standpoint for the for, for the family government if a man refuses to fill his role of leadership then somebody should be feeling it somebody should be feeling because if the wife says oh my husband refuses to fill his role of leadership and he abandons the family home Okay, should the wife also be looking and say, she be the, the Bible says that man is head of the house, then she should step in and not usurp the authority of the man, but try to assist. Try to assist. I'm going to give illustrations. Let me read the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21 to 25. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21 to 25. He says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. Your own husband. You don't have business submitting to another man's um, husband, okay? Your own husband. As unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything, okay? Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loves the church. And gave himself for it. When he was saying that, he was talking to the whole church. Okay, when he says submitting yourself one to another, what it means is that you shouldn't lord it over one another. You shouldn't say, "Oh, the Lord has made me your head now. Therefore, whatever I say in this house is permanent." No, it should be a position you are stepping into with humility. Remember what the Bible says about Jesus in the book of Hebrews. He said that. Um, who thought it not robbery to be equal? Is it Hebrews or Philippians? He said, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God? But he made himself of no reputation. He said, and took upon, upon himself the form of a servant. Okay? And because of that, what did God do? God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every other. You see, he didn't come and start saying, oh, I'm the son of God. And he made himself of no reputation. In fact, the fame and the glory he was supposed to take, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't boast about, he didn't go about boasting about it. He laid it down. He laid it down. And did see what God did. So that is what the Bible is saying. Husbands should not lord it over their wives. Oh, I'm the head of the house. You know, in, there are some homes that, <laughs> the way the husband says it, it's so annoying. Like, and, and at that point, you don't expect that that kind of a woman will be submitting. Because now you're trying to lord it over her. Don't forget that it should be a position that you are stepping into. Understanding your role. The woman as well with joy, with seeing you in that position, will help you feel that role as, as much as you're also helping her to feel that role. Okay, the illustration I'm trying to give before is that if you have a husband and a wife and the husband is not saved, okay, and because of that, of course, it says, okay, maybe it says that in this house, my, you are not allowed to go to church. Um, my children should not go to any church. They should sit down in the house. You see, that man is already disobeying because the head of every man is God. He himself is not obeying God. So, so long as he's not obeying God, okay, so long as his leadership, his headship is not founded on God, he is not the judge of his wife's conscience. Both of them are submitting to Christ spiritually or expected to submit to Christ spiritually. Like it, a story was told about um, a great minister of faith and healing, um, Smith Wigglesworth. If you have read Smith Wigglesworth's um, book, you will know that he was a great revivalist in his time, but it didn't happen cheaply. There was a time in his life that he backslided and he stopped going to church. And at a point, he was just so frustrated with life that he told his wife to stop going to church. But the wife looked him in the face with humility and said, my husband, I still recognize you as the head of this home, but you see, you are not the Lord over, you are not the Lord and Savior over my life. And I can't stop going to church because the Bible instructs that I should not neglect the fellowship and this man will, you know, he would, he would get angry, he would get irritated when the wife says that. But the wife will not say it with, you know, the way, the Bible says that a soft answer turn it away rot. There's a way you will say something and the other person can easily be irritated and put off. It's, I know you guys can relate what I'm saying. So she wouldn't start shouting, oh, you're not my Lord, you're not my Savior, making it a thing and an issue. And you expect him not to take it personally, Okay. That is not going to happen. But this woman, they say she will answer him softly and say, uh, I, I recognize you that you're my husband, you are the leader of this woman, I give you your respect. Whatever you want for me to do, I'm going to do it. But you see this particular one, it's, it's a service to my Lord. And you are not my Lord, you are not my Savior. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to sit in the house. I'm taking the kids with me. You should be the one leading us to church. But if you're not going to do it, I'm not going to sit back and let the children, you know, suffer from 
misleading so i'm going to take up that responsibility and there was a day they said after warning her several times that she will go and come back he told her if you go today i'm going to lock you out and truly to his word he locked this woman out and she was in the cold all through the night and he came in the morning and as he opened the woman just fell backwards into the house you know but instead of her to get angry they said she woke up dusted herself like she stood up dusted herself and looked the husband in the eye with a smile and said what would you love to have for breakfast the was like ah, you know he, he couldn't believe that that could be the in fact he wanted the wife to pick a fight he was even more irritated by the fact that she wasn't even giving her that attitude that he wanted but with time you know with time he got back on his feet and he changed and things turned around that's the way it should be okay not the other way around so when the bible says that from um that the wife the, the husband is the head of the wife it is not a spiritual standpoint because both of them are both subject to the lord okay it doesn't determine the way when the wife comes to Christ. God doesn't see them as male or female. God sees them as the same. He said there's neither male or female. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. You know, that's what the Bible says. And he said that the two of them shall become one flesh. So God is seeing them as one flesh, not as two individuals, as, you know, as, as it seems. Now, let's talk about the chapter 3. Um, most wives always, I mean, always obey their husbands. Um... The book of 1 Corinthians, I'm taking a background scripture for 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34. It says, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also seeth the law. So if you read the scriptures, let's, we are going to be dealing with the, 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 the last part of the scripture. It says, it is not permitted for them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also say the law. So in this place, Paul is even referring us to the law. So let's see what the law says about it. So, And if we are talking about the law, there are three things. It's either the Ten Commandments or the Book of Moses or the old, the old entire Old Testament. So the, 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 the Ten Commandments didn't have anything to say about women keeping silence or not. Now... So it's either Paul was referring to the books of Moses or the entire Old Testament. So what does the Old Testament have to say about women speaking in the church? Read the book. If we read the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, you know, downwards, we see that the Bible clearly stated that God made them male and female, man and woman. And it confirmed, the Bible confirmed that they were both made in the image of God. It didn't segregate against them. It didn't say a man was more superior to a man, okay, like the way some people put it. Okay, this and um. And later on, when Adam was created, he said that he recognized Adam's need for a wife, for an inspiration, for support, for help. You know, I said, you can't, you can't continue to live like this. You need somebody, you need it. So I'll make you a help meet. So when he wanted to make, if he didn't say he wanted to make somebody who was going to be inferior to Adam, okay, he made him a help meet. Okay, and the help me was not supposed to be downtrodden, was not supposed to be inferior or a, or a subordinate to the man in the spiritual sense, rather, was supposed to be a subordinate to the man in the family sense, in the man and in the husband and wife disposition. That's what it was meant to be. In the Genesis account of creation, there was no sign of inequality between man and woman. But however, when the fall of, after the fall of man, a curse was laid on Eve, and that gave left a penalty to women. Okay, let's read what this penalty was. The book of Genesis, chapter three and verse sixteen. He said, "I will greatly multiply thy pain." And the suffering of thy conception, he said, in pain shall thou bring forth children, for thy, hus for thy husband shall be thy desire, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, this was both a penalty and a prophecy. He says that he, the desire of the woman will be for the man. Okay? Your desire as a woman is for your husband. And he said he will rule. It was both a prophecy and a penalty for the sin that um, Eve committed. Okay? And this curse fell on if not as a woman, but as a wife, as a wife. So it is a man, um, it is not a man-woman disposition. It is a husband and wife disposition. It fell on her as a wife. Even the penalty was as a wife, not just as a woman. Okay. It's Galatians 3.20 says there is neither male nor female. Okay. So with God, there is no, there is no segregation. Now, let's further get um, more understanding on this. First Peter chapter 3, verse 6. Let's see what Peter said. 
He says, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter's year, as long as you do well and are, all, and are not afraid with any amazement. It is possible for somebody to want to leave this verse and say, you see, he said, just like Sarah did to Abraham, calling him Lord. Okay. No. Yeah, truly. Abraham was calling him Lord and obeyed Abraham, just like wives should obey their husband. But that doesn't mean she didn't have a voice of her own. That doesn't mean Abraham um, ruled over Sarah with domination, with authority, with all severity. No. She had a place. They're like, let's see if it, let's see from the scriptures if it is true. Genesis chapter 16, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 16, verse 12 and 6 says, And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abraham said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is thy in thy hand, do to her as it pleased thee. And when Sarah dealt her lit with her, she fled from her, her face. So we see that even though Abraham was the Lord over Sarah, Abraham allowed Sarah to have her way. You know, after Isaac was born, that um, Hagar started misbehaving and all of that. Sarah, the Bible confirmed that Sarah dealt with her so badly that, you know, she had to run away. And Abraham gave his consent for anything to be done. Like, she wanted, she said she doesn't like the way this woman is treating her own son, that she wants to suppress her son and all of that. Abraham gave her a voice, allowed her to make a decision. So if the Bible was implying that, um, the men had the final say, they had the final authority, and the Bible said we should learn from Sarah, okay? Abraham wouldn't be giving um, Sarah a chance to even make any decisions at all. You see, and God backed Sarah up. You see, God backed Sarah up. How do I know? The Bible says so. Genesis chapter 21, verse 10 to 12. He said, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bond woman and her son, for the son of this bond woman shall not be here with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight. Even Abraham was not happy with that decision. But look at what happened. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bond woman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God told Abraham, at least this ones, if not many other, but at least this ones, God sided with Sarah, okay, to support what she was doing. So if women don't even have a voice, God won't be. Because even him was grievous with the decision that he didn't like it, just like in this modern day, some husbands don't like decisions that their wife gives to them, that their wife makes. They tell you, some, 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 even, some cultures even tell you, don't, don't pay attention to what a woman says. Some cultures say, don't even open up to a woman. She will finish you, she will deal with you. You know, that's, that's not biblical. Fine, if you are saying woman is different, if it is your wife, hmm, you have the responsibility to work together with her, to do things together with her, to be on the same side with her, you know, make the right decisions together. It's not like one person is not allowed to say anything. That's going to be like a servant master kind of relationship. And that's not what marriage is about. Okay? Marriage is beautiful. But marriage is honorable. The Bible confirms it. So it is from a marriage point of view. So it is not supposed to be a man. Even Abraham was being called Lord. But that didn't mean it was Lord and Savior. It was Alpha and Omega of the whole thing. Even his decision to marry, uh, to take Hagar's wife, it was because he listened to his wife, you see. It was because, oh, this woman has suffered too long and he wasn't saying, I'm the Lord. I can't just, as long, as much as Abraham was intimate with God, he still listened. He listened. I can't say the outcome was the best of decisions, but it, it's just a place to show you that, okay, there was, there was equal conversation. They were on the same level, on the same page. That's the point. Some, some people go as far as saying that a woman or a, 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 a woman or a wife should obey her husband in everything. No, sorry. The Bible didn't say a wife should obey her husband in everything. Only by things, okay? In, 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 not in everything. She should have a voice of her own. She can choose to disagree sometimes. And that doesn't mean she's, what do they call it? That doesn't mean she's rude or uh, she, she's trying to usurp authority. No. We are humans too. Sometimes you give your opinions. You might not like it, but... You should listen to it. If you think it's good, fine. If you think it's not good, you can say, okay, there are better ways to say things. Oh, I don't agree with this now. Or maybe we can think about this later. Okay, or we can do it in a better way. Not just totally putting somebody down. She's not a damn subject. That's not wife's heart. That's not what women, wives, let me say, are supposed to be. So when Sarah was right, God sided with her. God is not going to side with a wrong husband, okay? He is not going to side with a wrong husband than the way he will side with a wrong wife.
just the same thing so if the husband is right god is going to side in with the husband same way he's going to side in with the husband, wife if the wife is right he won't say because you are the head of the home you are taking wrong decisions and god is going to side you no it doesn't work that way thank god for good wives they don't need to be put down oh and i know that there are some bossy wives so if a man is going to sit down and do nothing while his wife decides to get him pegged then let him be impaired you should take care of your home you should know how to deal with your if, if you can't handle your home that's your problem that's your business your, the bible has clearly said that you should be the leader of your home so you should lead your home you know you should lead your home rightly so if you decide to get them you know women don't even like men who are who behave like puppets they want men who can make right decision who can put their foot on the ground and say i think i want it to be done like this and your wife can trust your judgment and say you're making the right decision and that doesn't actually mean that you are going to ignore what she says okay we have good women out there who are helping their husbands, helping their husbands. In fact, some, some husbands will even tell you most of the decisions they have made right in their homes. Their wives made it on their behalf. Some, 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 some husbands trust their wives to a level that they can say, if I'm not around, she, any decision she makes in my absence, I can go for it. I can vouch for her. Okay, and that's a level that women too must earn. Okay, we have good women. But if a man decides to let his wife get him impaired, then he should get him picked. That's it. Then the second part of this um, is that um, should a woman obey a man in a, a, a husband? Should a woman obey her husband in everything? The answer is no. Okay, it is not a sane argument to say that a woman or a, sorry a wife should obey her husband in everything. Okay, now because some hus some husbands are such brutes, such that if everything they ask of is granted then there's going to be serious problem for instance if an enraged husband asks his wife to kill all their children nobody will ask the wife to do it because they know it's clearly not the right decision to make and if she can't do that then she, clearly she's also not permitted to follow everything that the husband says it's as simple as that okay you know some people have come out to argue so strongly that it is the bible says it, that she must submit in everything Okay, there are some examples of so many women who, who we know clearly that if they have submitted to their husbands and everything, there will be serious problem. The story of Abigail is an example. Let's read the book of Second Samuel. The book of First Samuel chapter 25. Let me read it. It says, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, we send thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own hand. So Abigail was a woman, a wise woman, whose husband was a fool because the Bible clearly said it. The Bible said that um, the Bible calls him the son of Bia, okay? He, if not for the intervention of the wife, Abigail, there would have been so much bloodshed. But because a woman refused to side in with the wrong, see, God will never side in with what is wrong. He will always stand with what is right. Because he's the head of the home and he's taking wrong decisions doesn't mean God is going to side in with him. Never. God constantly remains with what is right. God stands for righteousness, for justice. It doesn't matter who takes it. It is the right that God will side in with. So that's how it is. If not for the decision of Abigail, you know how many people would have died? He went behind and met up with David on the way and begged and said, oh, please don't do this, you know, and pleaded on behalf of the husband, okay? If he has waited and said, oh, I only follow her mouth, she wouldn't even take that decision in the first place. But because of the simple decision that a wise woman took, okay, that problem was averted. And the same applies to Sarah as well. God sided in with Sarah. She didn't have to keep, when she was going through tough times, she wasn't just subjecting herself to that vile problems, keeping quiet, taking everything all, everything hook like and She spoke her mind when it was not pleasant. Oh, this woman is maltreating my son. And God sided in with, with her. And said, that woman is actually not the son of promise. Okay, so God will only always side in with what is right. It doesn't matter who takes what, that right decision. That's how it is. You won't say because the Bible says a woman should obey the husband, should be subject to the husband in everything. The husband is making wrong decisions and the woman should follow blindly or should just keep quiet, not say anything. No, no, that's not how it was intended to be. Let me emphasize, according to the author, that a woman must be true to her conviction, even if it's up to the point of losing her husband. Like the Bible confirmed that the book of and first Corinthians chapter 7 verse 15 he said but if the unbelieving depart let him depart he says a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such case he said but god has called us to peace so if that husband self is going to stand as a stumbling block to your conviction if you want if you want to live let him live that's what the author says 
a wife must be true to a conviction even at the cost of losing the husband because Christ is the head of both the man and the woman. You cannot say, oh, because you want to honor your husband and you will throw your salvation. You know, so many women have backslidden, backslidden because of the kind of husbands that they married. It will be like, oh, he said we shouldn't go to church today. Oh, he said we can't pray today. Oh, but, so how then did the Bible now say that through your chaste character, you'll be able to win him over? Do you think it's by just keeping quiet and just saying, oh, yes, sir. Oh, not saying anything. Just sucking everything all in. Just trying to be a fool. No, you're going to do it, but you're going to do it with wisdom. If you are refuting, you will say, you will refute in a hasty way. And he says, no more praying like you. They, they also give several illustrations of um, um, a, a, a particular uh, member of his church who used to come to church, but the husband was an unbeliever, and he used to fight this woman, you know, tooth and nail so that she won't come to church. But this woman would come at all, because there was even a time he stole away her shoes in the cold, you know, in, during winter seasons. You can't even come out with your bed, you can't even come out with just ordinary shoes, but this woman still came. So they were trying to explain that this woman was so, you know, so reserved for God to the point that even if she didn't have anything to wear, she would still look for a way and come, you know. And this happened and that gradually, gradually the husband started coming. Like they started, the husband gave his life because he said there was even a, a time he said they were not praying in their homes. They were not saying prayers before meals. They were not, you know, the children were not coming to church. So she had to stand up to the tax and say, it is your job as the leader of this one to lead us to church. But if you are not going to lead the children to you, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to sit down and wait till all my children walk into hell. So she started. The husband will initially just be looking at them. He say when they are praying, the man will just sit up there. He will be looking at them angrily, frustrated, you know. But with time, he started with time. He started kneeling with them, even when they wanted to stay say the grace at the table, the husband said, my husband, you are, it is your right as the husband of this one with respect. I'm saying that you should pray over the food. But if you're not going to pray, I'm going to do it anyways. So he will, she will pray. The husband will refuse to pray. Initially, he won't say amen. But later, he started saying amen. Before you knew it, the man became a leader again, picked up from where he left off, you know. And that was it. So that is the way it should be. It's not like because God says you should obey your husband in everything. He's, he's now an hindering block. Because he's not the Lord of your conscience. He's not the one to judge. Both of you are going to give account to God. So because you think he's the Lord of your conscience, he's, he's taking away the faith that you... That's why you should not even marry an unbeliever. Okay, the Bible says be not unequally yoked together with... So that you will avoid all these headaches. At least you will have lesser issues to deal. We're not saying if you marry a believer, all the problems will be solved. But at least to a barest minimum, you have lesser problems. Times that will be spent trying to pray for his conversion, trying to pray for his deliverance, trying to pray for a change of heart. You know that is already being said to you. You have lesser problems to pray for. You are even praying for things that will benefit you and him. Okay, that will add more advantage, not the basics. You see, it's for your own good. And you're not smarter than God. And a lot of people will still tell you, fine, we have unbelievers who are married to believers and they still have a good home. They won't tell you the parts. They are not enjoying it. They are because you can't be smarter than God. You can't be wiser than your creative. He says this part is not clearly the right part. Then believe me, it is not the right part. You are going to now work hard. You are going to some people don't even get their bearing back. They enter that marriage and that's it. Their their their, their, their service salvation is over. It's off. And okay, how do you want to raise God godly tree? Which is even the ultimate reason. Why you should be in a Christian home, raising him godly offspring, like the book of Malachi says. So how will you do that? You'll be going this way, the other, can two work together? He must three, three. Can two work together? I said they agree. Apparently, no, they can't. So you're not supposed to obey your husband in everything. Okay, but because God will only side him with what is right. No, it's wrong. It doesn't matter. Even if he's the head, it doesn't matter. God will, God will only side him with what is right. So the last part of this chapter is submission. Should Wives submit to their husbands. Yes, that's what the Bible says. You should submit to your own husband, not to every husband, to your own husband. Okay, but submitting in this context doesn't mean that you should be a slave. No, he was only admonishing in a sense that they should do it in a way that will be less of, you know, disagreement, less, less of contention. And he was even admonishing, admonishing the church. He said, submitting yourselves one to another. He was talking to the church. Okay, let's see it. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. He said, married women in the same way, be submissive to your husband, so that even if some of them disbelieve the word, he said, they may, apart from the word, be won over by the daily life of their wives. 
And it says, after seeing your daily lives to so chaste and reverent, yours ought not to be outward adornment of plating the air, putting on jewels of gold or wearing various dresses, but an inward beauty of nature, the imperishable ornament of a gentle and peaceful spirit, which is indeed precious in the sight of God. And it says, for this is how of old the holy women who set their hopes upon God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their husbands. The, thus Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him master, and you have become Sarah's children, if... You do the right and permit nothing whatever to terrify you. Husbands in the same way live with your wives with a clear recognition of the fact that they are weaker than you. Yet since you are heirs with them, you are heirs with them, you see? You are heirs with them of God's free gift of life. Treat them with honor so that your prayers be not unrestrained. So that your prayers be not in that. So even husbands are supposed to take caution. Because a dispute with your wife can even be an, can be an hindrance. A maltreatment to your wife can be an hindrance to your prayer. That's what the Bible says. So even as much as the Bible admonished that women should be submissive, the men are also admonished to love their wives, okay? And to also understand that women are of weaker vessels, okay? And that also, that doesn't mean that they are supposed to be slaves to each other, but rather, that means they should try everything that they can by all means to understand one another so that fight malice disagreement can be cut off to the barest minimum can be reduced to the barest minimum so that they can live more in unity in one accord peaceably without hindrances to their prayers that's what it means not that everything he says yes sir yes sir yes sir some people that even do all those yes sir yes sir before they go married you find out that immediately after they are married doesn't even take long everything fizzles out because it was just pretense Okay, so that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that because it, the Bible admonishes that you should be submissive, you should throw away, you know, you should throw away everything that you know how to do, your 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 your, your sense of discernment, your reasoning, your logical, whatever. And in the same way, you should also understand that you are going to do that for your husband or to your husband because you understand what love means. As much as, as much as because it is the part of the women that usually more emphasize the submission part. But the men too should love their wives and they should love them correctly because you need to learn how to, you know, you need to understand this person, okay? And love is a big word. If you read the book of First Corinthians chapter 13, the book of love, see, you won't be smiling when you are reading that book because the Bible says it does not rejoice in its rightness or it, it, love doesn't claim rights. You will say, I know my rights. I'm not going to trade the way because I married you. You said I should be submissive. I'm not. Right doesn't know my rights. You see, sorry, love doesn't understand what right is. You, you are willing to let it go. You are willing to let problems, things that can cause. But that doesn't mean that it should not be logic. See, people, you people understand these things. You know what it means. You know when to let it go. You don't have to nag, nag, nag over it. You want to prove your point. You want to show you have it. See, love trades away is, is rightness. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't, it's not resentful, it's not boastful, it's not arrogant, it's not rude. That's what the Bible says. So if you understand all these things and you claim you love that man, and that man also claims he loves you, there won't be problems. In fact, even if they're, because we are human beings, let's say, the issues will always come up. It's normal, okay? But it shouldn't linger for too long before one person says, Oh, I know I was wrong, I'm sorry. Oh, I knew I didn't do it right, I didn't say it right, I didn't act rightly, I'm sorry. And life continues, that's the way it is. So if you have not yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, what are you still waiting for? Subscribe, we have my community, please. Just hit the subscribe button. Don't also hesitate to click on the notification bell so that each time I post a new video, you're going to be notified. Okay, like and comment. What do you think about these topics? I know you have um, opinions, you have suggestions, you have clarification. Probably there's something you want to add. Don't hesitate to leave them in the comment section. Give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it in any way. I'm going to do the concluding parts of this video because I don't want it to be I don't want it overly too long, okay, so that, okay, so the remaining three other chapters that are left, I'm going to do a concluding video for you. Please be on the lookout, okay? And um, once again, thank you for sticking with me to the very end. I remain peace, Ogumumbi, and I'll catch you in my next one. Thanks for watching. Bye. <music>